ago. Uh, we have been talking about what it means to be a reptile, and the whole deal is making this transition from an aquatic lifestyle to a fully terrestrial one. Um, and we had talked about the fact that it, it all comes down to that um, chorionic amniotic egg, right? So this egg that has this uh, chorion that's surrounding it, and then um, this amniotic egg. Um, so uh, what that does is it has a number of requirements. We've already talked about most of those. Number one, you have to have some kind of intermittent organ if you're going to do that. Because fertilization then necessarily has to take place inside the female, right? So before uh, the shell is laid down around the egg. Um, so they do that in a variety of different ways, right? Um, they do that with hemipenes if you're, a, if you're a lizard or a snake or other sorts of intermittent organs. Most of those things are derived from some sort of modification of part of the cloacal wall. Uh, birds obviously do it just fine. Lots of birds don't have an intermittent organ, right? Um, so the songbirds don't have intermittent organs, and they achieve internal fertilization by using what we refer to as the cloacal kiss. So they just oppose their cloacas together, and they transmit sperm in that way. Obviously, it's very quick to the point, right? No uh, lounging around, you know, on the covers afterwards, smoking cigarettes and you know chatting about it. That doesn't happen in birds. It's wham bam, thank you, ma'am. They're done, and they're off to other important things. Okay. So there are two consequences of having internal fertilization, though. Um, one is that it reduces the cost for the male. So you're not wasting any sperm, right? All the sperm are transmitted, right? That's one benefit of that. The other, though, is this rather significant cost. And that significant cost is the fact that the cost of reproduction for the female has just gone sky high. All right, so it's a reduction in cost for the male, but it's an enormous increase in cost for the female. There is another important thing to think about when you think about internal fertilization. Um, what I'd like you to think about, if, if any of you are, live on a farm or have had uh, livestock, um, if you've ever had sheep, right, what do you know about rams? about the size of their toolkits. No, no clue? You've never had sheep, you've never dealt with rams or anything? We were up in the Black Hills um, a number of years ago, uh, and there are desert mountain bighorns up there. Um, you can see desert bighorns when you're at lower elevations as well in, in the Badlands and so on. Um, but when you see when you see a bighorn sheep and it's a it's a ram, and it's during mating season, the testicles are like footballs; they're gigantic. Okay, and as a human primate, right, you stand there looking at those things, going, "Oh my God!" You know, I mean, those things would put any primate to shame. Why are those testicles so large? It's not just for grins and giggles. It's not because they're trying to show off, right? It's got nothing to do with that. Why do they have such large testicles? And the answer is, it relates directly to the kind of mating system that they have. So when you see an animal, whether it's an insect or whether it's um, whatever it happens to be, if it's a situation where there's potential sperm competition, there's strong selection pressure to increase testicle size. What do I mean by sperm competition? What I mean is when it's possible for the female to have multiple matings. So when the female has potentially multiple matings, the male that delivers the greatest number of sperm is the one that's most likely to fertilize the female. So there's intense selection pressure on the males to increase the amount of sperm production. And they do that by having these really large testicles. So when you look at these not big horned sheep and you see these enormous testicles, you, what you right away know is this is an animal that has a polygynous mating system. In other words, there's going to be an alpha male 
and that alpha male has access to almost all of the females. And the subordinate males don't, right? So he's basically flooding the market with his sperm, right? Trying to ensure the fact that he's the one that sires all of the offspring. Okay, so internal fertilization reduces sperm cross, uh, sperm loss, increases the um, probability of reproductive success, and obviously increases the cost of reproduction to the female, right? So those are um, some of the other uh, issues. The other sorts of things that happen, right, and when we make this transition, is that you have to change the way you breathe. Okay, so now suddenly, if you've divorced yourself from water, you're no longer relying on respiration across the skin. Your skin is now designed to prevent water loss, so it's a dry skin rather than a wet skin. So you no longer have gas exchange across the skin. That also means you don't have water loss across the skin. We've already talked about the fact that in that same step, right, we now have a three and a half chamber heart trying to separate those, the pulmonary and the systemic circulations, right? And then, of course, there's this other change that happens with the occipital condyles. Amphibians have two occipital condyles, reptiles have one, okay? So the reptiles now have an atlas and an axis, axis and they now change the way the centra of the vertebrae are made. So vertebral centra, that's the body of the vertebra, is really derived of two parts. There's a pleurocentrum and an intercentrum. And in the amphibians, one of those is dominant. In reptiles, the other one is dominant. And that's how, the, that's how you can tell the difference between amphibians and reptiles in the fossil record if all you have is the vertebrae. Okay? So there's that odd sort of change. It's, it's sort of this silly little, ridiculous little thing that happens, right? But in the evolution of vertebrates, it turns out to be a big deal because the one design leads to modern amphibians. The other design leads to reptiles, birds, and mammals, okay? So one view, one, one solution of the problem is sort of a dead end the other solution of the problem ends up being really productive, okay? So what they have to do now, now that you've made the transition to land, somehow you have to maintain osseous strength. So you want to maintain the integrity and the strength, right, of the skeletal system, at the same time enhancing mobility, and at the same time reducing cost and minimizing mass. Because now you're trying to haul this body across land, supporting it at basically two points, the pectoral and pelvic regions, right, instead of relying on water to support you on all sides. All right, so the, just very quickly, the other thing, we've already talked about this a little bit, as you, all, 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 each and every one, terrestrial vertebrates, not fish, all terrestrial vertebrates, their pelvic girdle is comprised of three bones. All right, six bones, three on each side, okay? The ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Everybody has three. There are none with four, none with five, none with six. Oh, wait, marsupials. Marsupials have these weird little bones called epipubic bones, which stick up from the pubis, but those aren't really part of the pelvic girdle. Those are sort of a modern invention that get tacked on. More about epipubic bones later on, but all of them have three bones, all right? Remind me tomorrow, let Timmy Jeff worry about it. All right. So they all have three. What happens in the transition from amphibians to reptiles to mammals is we increase the solidity of the connection between the pelvic girdle and the vertebral column. Amphibians, one sacral vertebra. Reptiles, two. Mammals, three plus. OK? 
okay? BERT, it's all one solid unit. All right. I'm going to skip all that other sort of stuff there. There are some other cool things that happen in reptiles. And that is one interesting thing is for most reptiles, they have this nictitating membrane that goes over the eye. What the hell is a nictitating membrane? Well, you have these things called eyelids. Behind that eyelid is another transparent membrane. And that is called the nictitating membrane, and it is mobile. Okay, so it can be open and closed. What that means is you can blink and still see through the whole blink. There are a number of mammals that have nictitating membranes, right? But it is a reptilian characteristic. There is one weird group of reptiles where that's changed, and those are the snakes. Snakes never blink. Okay? They never close their eyes. Think of the horror that that presents, right? So many times in your life, you just close your eyes because you can't see. You just don't want to watch, okay? It's just too horrific to imagine, so you just close your eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. My son, the 30 years old, and he does it all the damn time, right? Just can't watch this. He just closes his eyes. He's done with it, okay? Snakes can, this explains why snakes so often have such a bad attitude because they're exposed to so much awful stuff. They can't close their eyes, they can't tune it out. Okay? Snakes have a fossorial origin. All right? So we know that they have a fossorial origin. And if you're fossorial, there's reduction of the eyes. And what happened to snakes is they lost eyes. So they had perfectly functioning eyes, just like all other vertebrates. And once they became fossorial, that went away. They then went from being fossorial back to being terrestrial and volant and arboreal and all those other things. So they took these starting materials and reinvented the eye. And what they did was, with the eye, it's covered with a single scale called the brilla, which is the German word for glasses. So they have this one scale, which is transparent, which sits right on top of the eye. The problem is the retina of the eye, the rods and the cones in the retina, are totally unorganized. It's not like you, where you have this wonderfully designed array of, ret of, of rods and cones that give you both color vision and movement information and, all, and shapes and edges and all of that sort of stuff. Snakes don't have that. So a snake can see vague motion, it can see light, and it can see dark. But that's all. And it can't close its eyes. The eyes are open all the time. When a snake wants to figure out where is that damn rat, it's not using its eyes. When you walk in front of the cage of a snake and the cage tracks you, it's not tracking you with its eyes, it's tracking you with its thermal signature, with your thermal signature. And it's capable of doing that to a thousandth of a degree centigrade. All right, so there are a number of other things that happen in, in, um, in the, the intraocular muscles of the iris are striated, not smooth. What does that mean? What's the difference between striated muscles and smooth muscles? How do they differ? Well, let's think of some of your striated muscles. Which muscles in your body are striated? Well, the muscles in your appendages. Okay? Those are the muscles over which you have control. So you can think, okay, biceps contract and your arm comes up. You have smooth muscles as well. Those are the muscles lining your, your gut, lining your esophagus, your stomach, your intestines. You have no control over those muscles. So strided muscles, you have control over. Smooth muscles, you do not. In reptiles, those intraocular muscles, the muscles inside the eyes, the ones that control the pupil are under voluntary control. That's different from what you have. Your muscles are smooth. You cannot 
automatically dilate your pupils. The reptile can. Why? What's the advantage to being able to dilate your pupil? Well, let's think about it. How many of you are into photography? Anybody? How many of you have ever had a real cam, not a cell phone camera or a little, you know, click clack camera, I mean, but a real camera? So you, you, see, you see something and you want to focus on that particular object and you want everything else to be blurry. You just want that one thing to be perfectly in focus and everything around it to be blurry. So what do you do? You open up the diaphragm, right? So you take the F and instead of having F22, you open it all the way up to F1.2. So now you have a super large diaphragm and that one thing is perfectly in focus and everything a fraction of an inch in front of it and behind it is out of focus. And that's what these guys are doing. By being able to open up that diaphragm, they can focus on one thing and one thing only. Everything else goes blurry. So they're letting more light in and they can focus on that one thing. Think about raptors. Raptors have these bones around the eyes. What are those bones called? If you've ever seen a, a raptor skeleton, it has these bony plates that go around the eye, right? Those are the sclerotic rings. What do they do with those sclerotic rings? When they contract the muscles that are attached to those, it takes the eyeball and makes it longer. What does that do? So it takes the eyeball, squeezes it, so instead of being this nice round shape, it's now squeezed into a hot dog shape. Well, if the lens is at the front and the sensor is at the back, that's just like having a telephoto lens. You've just increased the focal length. So what a hawk is doing when it squeezes those muscles, it's using its eyes like a zoom lens so it can focus in on that one thing. Yeah? Uh, I heard, saw a while back, um, there was this article about uh, some R&D lab is working on making contact lenses that uh, sort of do a similar thing. That's kind of, it's actually kind of creepy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, technology, pretty much all technology mimics nature. Yeah, well, absolutely, right? Everything from, from the way we build submarines, right? We rely on, on dolphins and things of that sort when we build submarines, that the whole design is based on what's going on in the skin of swimsuits and Olympic swimmers, lenses and cameras, all that stuff, sensors and cameras, all that stuff, it's based on what you see in nature. I mean, the, the physical world has a much better understanding of itself than we do. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, I'm going to not talk about the, um, the tabular bone. Uh, one of the obvious differences between <coughs> reptiles and mammals is what goes on with the tabular bone. We're just going to skip right over that. Uh, we know what happens, we just don't understand why. I do want, and we've talked about this a little bit, I do want to talk about this important difference between the skulls of reptiles and mammals who so are forgetting about amphibians. Okay, we're done with amphibians. Now we're talking about reptiles, mammals, and birds. This condition right here is called the anapsid condition. There is no temporal opening. Here we have two designs in which there's a single opening. That's the synapsid design. Make sure I got that right. B is the synapsid design. That's the uriapsid design. All those guys went extinct. And this is the diapsid design. So these are the turtles. This is everybody else. So these are the birds, the snakes, the lizards, the dinosaurs, the crocodilians. Okay? Those are the mammals. This group went extinct. What's different between this group and this group? Easy. The bones that surround that temporal fenestra. So here... It's the squamosal, the jugal, the postorbital, 
Okay? Here, it's the squamosal, postorbital, and parietal. Why this group didn't make it, who knows? But they went extinct, and that one is still there. These are the two most successful groups right here. The turtles are going away. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay? They're awesome. It's sad when they're gone. We'll never have anything like it again. How do you know? Why does the, the, the imminent extinction of turtles, why? I mean, life, the history of life on this planet shows that they're going away. No species lives forever. The average lifespan of any species is about 7 million years. Okay? The turtles are going away. Once they're gone, you'll never see anything like it again. That's the real bummer about mass extinction events. Because when you lose something like that, sure, you'll get species diversity coming back, but you're not going to see anything like a turtle. How can I make that statement? Because, I can make it because, all of the steps that went into getting to that point, right, it's a long sequence of events, you can't replicate that sequence of events because each step is dependent on the previous step. If you don't have the previous step, you cannot get to the next step. And all of the starting materials are not there anymore. The, the initial conditions are gone. You might ultimately end up with another animal that has a hard covering on the top or something like that, but it's going to be fundamentally different from the turtle design. The big thing about this design, well, both of these designs, that temporal opening is all about making room for the temporalis muscle. So that now suddenly the temporalis muscle can come through here and attach to the top of the skull. The temporalis muscle is the one that attaches to the coronoid process and allows you to close your jaw. The bigger that muscle is, the stronger your bite. So this and this design make it possible to have a bigger, more powerful bite. Which if you're going to kill stuff with your mouth, is good. Or if you're going to bite through bones, is good. The interesting consequence of having these two openings is this. You can break that right there, you can make that loose, and you can make that loose and that loose right there, and suddenly you have what's referred to as a kinetic skull. And if you've ever watched a bird, when a bird opens its mouth, what does it do? The upper bill comes up and the lower bill goes down. So it does that. When a mammal opens its mouth, it does that. So the upper jaw is stationary, the lower one is mobile. But if you're a diapsid, you can do that. Now the dinosaurs didn't do that. They didn't have a kinetic skull. But there are lizards with the kinetic skull, and snakes have a kinetic skull. And the fact that snakes have a kinetic skull means that they can consume prey items that are bigger than their head. A lizard cannot eat anything that's bigger than its own mouth. A snake can. There's, there are glorious, there's glorious footage of anacondas swallowing pigs. Okay? They don't do it in a few minutes. It will take sometimes 24 hours for this animal to swallow that pig which presents an interesting dilemma for the snake, right? Because if you've got that, in, you have no secondary palate, and if you've got that pig in your mouth, that means you can't breathe. So how do they solve that problem? That's kind of cool. All right, so here, just as to illustrate that, there's the dermocranium, the cranium that goes over the top of the brain, right? There's the neurocranium right there. Here's the temporalis muscle. And as soon as you have that temporal opening, the temporalis muscle can bulge out and go to the top of the dermocranium. 
So now you have room for the belly of the muscle to expand, and the muscle is going to be longer as well. Remember, there are two things that make a powerful muscle. One is longer muscles are more powerful than short muscles, and two, increased cross-sectional area produces a more powerful muscle than a skinny muscle. All right, so let's look at some reptilian skull designs, okay? So let's ignore the anapsids. Oh, well, there is this sort of interesting thing that happens with anapsids. So the turtles have this problem, right? They've got this full dermal shield. And where's my turtle skull? I don't know where he went. Ah, there he is. They have this full dermal shield, okay? But if you look at the turtle skull, what they've done is they've taken that dermal, the dermocranium, and sort of eroded it away. And what that means now is that the muscles, the temporalis muscle, can come out here and bulge out really big, okay? So the turtle, even though it doesn't have an, a diapsid or synapsid design, cheats and just gets the dermal shield out of the way and then makes room in that way. So it has sort of gamed the system. But now look what happens, for example, in a python. It is a diapsid design, but notice that bar across the middle is now gone and you have a totally kinetic skull. Okay, here's an iguana. So there's the upper temporal opening. There's the lower temporal opening. All right, it is a diapsid. There's a lot of room for expansion of that temporalis muscle. All right. Let's look at some early, early um, these are still not officially reptiles. These are really still amphibians. So this is at the very, very, very early part of the reptilian radiation. And notice two things. Three bones back there, three bones back there. Look at that pectoral girdle. It's this massive thing. It's even bigger than that girdle. Okay? It's this big skeleton. This massive thing, there's a lot of bone mass there. And this animal somehow has to lug all this bone mass around. Not only is it expensive to lay down the bone, but now that you've got it, you've got to lug it around. Why have that huge pectoral girdle? Mammals don't do that. Birds don't do that. Okay? But these very early reptiles did that. It's like this gigantic suspension system on the front of a four-wheel drive truck or something, okay? It's the kind of suspension that you get on a farm truck. And farm trucks, as you know, are not cheap to drive. There we go. So, that reptilian mode has a number of consequences. We're now divorced from water. So now the earliest reptiles are able to, they have increased foraging options. They're also exposed to a greater variety of temperatures. It also means that they can operate at a higher body temperature. Why is that a good thing? It has a price. What do higher body temperatures do for you? Think about being a mammal. Here you are. Your body temperature is 98.6 plus or minus. Why? It's only 68 degrees or something outside. You're wasting heat. Why do you keep your body temperature up? This is for metabolism. So, so it's because you have a higher metabolism, why have a higher metabolism? I mean, what are you getting out of this higher metabolism? Faster growth rate. Maybe. Great. What's that doing for you? All you're doing is getting old, man. Well, I mean, I think it's doesn't it 
help you repair like the uh, faster? Right. It, it allows you to do what faster? Uh, I guess like heal or repair. Or yeah, so yeah, but you have to heal faster because you're exposed to more dangerous conditions because you're more active and so on, so you're injuring yourself more. So that's a good thing. But why do that? If you are if you're a reptile safe and snug as a bug in a rug down in a little rock crevice somewhere, not worrying about anything, calling it quits for the season, you'd be fine. Think about it. From the perspective of a snake or a lizard, time right now stands still. So time is not passing for them. It has come to a stop. Come spring, the clock starts again. Their meta metabolism winds up, and they're out there doing their business. But for you, the mammal, you're out there all the time now. What are you getting out of it? Basic biological question, the sort of question you can expect on the GRE. What are you getting out of having this high metabolic rate? Every other normal animal out there has said, screw this, I'm done. Winter's coming. Nothing to be done during winter, I'm waiting for spring. More Why don't we do the same thing? More reproduction opportunity. Yes. Because all the babes are out there, and if you're not out there with them, you're missing out on potential reproductive opportunities. So not only does the fact that you have a high metabolic rate make it possible for you to secure mates when it's cold, but it also makes it possible for you to lay claim to new habitats or to exploit new areas that are not available to the people, that, to the organisms that aren't active. So it increases your foraging options, your reproductive options, and your niche options that are not there if you're calling it quits. So the fact that reptiles have a higher operating temperature now means, too, that they can do that at least to a limited degree. Obviously, they're calling it quits in the winter, but it makes it possible for them to explore or exploit niches that are not available to the amphibians. All right, so let's look at some of the earliest reptiles. Man, that, and it's a partial skeleton, right? It's not complete. There are some missing parts. But notice how much, notice two things about this skeleton, right? Looks like a cross between a, what, well, what does it look like? You almost want to think it looks like a salamander, except for what? How do you know it's not a salamander? Well, what kind of ribs do salamanders have? Like none. Okay, salamanders. Holy smokes, those hemo arches are going all the way down the tail. Okay, so you have ribs that go all the way from here up here. You even have ribs in the neck. That's how you know it's a reptile. Okay. So the ribs go all the way down here, which right away tells you there is no diaphragm, so there is no forced ventilation of the lungs. Okay? It is this nice reptilian form, but notice how small the legs are. Where do you see that kind of a design? What animals have really short little wimpy appendages? Think about salamanders. Think about amphiumas little tiny appendages. Think about plethodontid salamanders, little tiny appendages. What sorts of animals have little tiny appendages? Animals that live in very complex habitats, where there's a lot of brush, a lot of nooks and crannies, a lot of things to get hung up on. That's what snakes did too. They were living, they had a fossorial lifestyle the appendages got smaller and smaller until they ultimately disappeared. You can't use legs inside a tunnel, right? So limb reduction, limb loss, happens in animals that live in extremely complex kinds of habitats. 
where the limbs actual be, actually become an impediment rather than a benefit. So this is probably an animal like that that lived in a very complex, very brushy, kind of lots of branches and rocks and cracks and crannies and all that kind of stuff that it had to navigate through. All right. There is this weird group of reptiles that shows up before the end of the Permian. They are reptiles, but they have a synapsid skull design. And they're a group of reptiles referred to as the therapsids. Okay? So therapsid, does that name sound familiar? Sure it does, right? Because the theria, the group theria, those are the mammals. And when we talk about the mammals, we talk about the eutherian mammals, and the prototherian mammals, and the metatherian mammals. So the placental mammals, the duckbill platypuses, the monotremes, right? And then the marsupials. But these guys are the therapsid reptiles. They have a single temporal opening, and there's this weird thing. They all have these gigantic sails on their backs. What are those sails about? Notice the posture. The standard reptilian posture limps out to the side like that. Okay? Which is hard to do. And if you think about it, the earliest we could go find a book about dinosaurs from the 1800s. I've got a couple in my office, right? Books that were published in the late 1800s, all about dinosaurs. And you look at the illustrations that they had of the dinosaurs, and they would have things like brontosaurus and whatnot standing like that. Think about what that would mean to have that to weigh 80 tons <laughs> and be in push-up position. Probably really suck. Yeah, it sucked real bad. And they knew it would suck. So what they did was, they said, well, look at all these dinosaurs. They have all these incredible necks. The necks are really long. So they said, ah, here's how we explain that. The dinosaurs were aquatic. They were walking along lakes, the bottoms of lakes and stuff. And the reason they had the long necks was so they could stick their heads up above the water to breathe. That's the only way they could explain it. Of course, what we got wrong was the fact that that's not the posture that they use. The dinosaurs, not these guys, but the dinosaurs had this posture, not that. But notice the sails. Notice that the illustration shows them getting into the water. What the hell is that all about? The early ideas about the evolution of the pelicosaurs, which is what these guys are, was that they used those sails so that once they got into the water, they could orient themselves to the wind, and the wind they were like sailboats. They'd go floating across the surface of the lake over to the other side. Isn't that cool? Imagine, there you are, a pelicosaur, right at the end of the Permian, spending your day catching the wind, floating from one side of the lake to the other. Wouldn't that be awesome? And uh, I just want to bring this up because uh, I know there's, uh, this is probably a picture of a dimetrodon or something related to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know there's a, uh, this trait has uh, convergently evolved in a dinosaur we call Spinosaurus. And uh, we've, I mean, uh, I've read a lot of uh, speculation on this, and, uh, and people think it's like somewhere, anything from uh, mating to regulating the body temperature to, it's, there's still a lot of debate on it today. So, so the first thing, it, the first thing we know, right, is that if they were using that to sail across the lake, if you stop to think about it critically, you'd have to ask yourself, okay, yeah, why? It seems like sort of, an ex it must have been a really big lake, for one thing, and or what that would imply is that the only place you would find these guys would be in areas where there were lakes. You wouldn't expect that sort of adaptation out on the open ocean, Right? Because what? You're going to sail out to the middle of the ocean, and then what? Okay? So it just, 
That part of it makes no sense. There is this interesting feature. If you look, those spines right there, those are the neural spines. So every vertebrae has this bump coming up. You have those too. You, you can feel those knobs on your back. Okay, each vertebra has one of those spinous, spinal processes. So it forms the neural arch, your, your dorsal hollow nerve cord goes right underneath, and then you have this big spine sticking up. If you look at those neural spines, what you discover is they're grooved. Each one has a big, large diameter groove in it. What the hell that's all about? Why have this groove in the bone? Why have that groove in the bone? Well, we know is that groove was there to support large diameter blood vessels. In other words, there was a lot of blood flow in that thing. Why would you have a lot of blood flow up in that sail? A lot of surface area. A lot of surface area. Okay, not a lot of volume, but a lot of surface area. You guys ever had any experience with jackrabbits? Ever? Jackrabbits are awesome. You go out, you go out west. We we get white-tailed jackrabbits on one small corner of Missouri, okay. But if you go out west and encounter black-tailed jackrabbits, they're amazing. These gigantic damn ears. And if you spot one and it's in the morning, the animal will look at you and the sun will be behind it, and you can basically see the sun right through the ear. You look at it, you can see all the little blood vessels in that ear. And what the jackrabbit is doing is it's using its ears as a thermoregulatory device. So it uses those ears either to dump heat when it's hot or to absorb heat when it's cold. And that's what most people think now about the function of these sails. So here's the key. These guys are the basal group that ultimately gives rise to the mammals. And here already, right, in this earliest scenario, they are modified, they're, they're developing this thermoregulatory strategy, okay, where they're using this big thing here as a heat exchange device, either to gain heat when it's cold and or to dump heat when they're too warm. All right, we will stop there.